and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, you, that you may will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And then if you look on to verse 20, it says these words, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know its desolation is near. And it's happening right now, folks. It's happening right at this minute. It really is. Verse 25 this time. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. And on the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, and men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then he said this, Then you will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. He said that. Aren't you glad he said that? Come on, say a good amen. amen. King is coming. Why do we believe in the second coming? Is it because of the passion of Bible preachers, teachers, how clever they are in aligning what's happening today, the last days, and all of that sort of stuff? No, not really. We believe 100% Jesus is coming because he said he would. And he promised he would. And he said it again here. Then you will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud of power and great glory. Verse 28, we'll end with this. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Now that's the word of the Lord tonight. We've read his word. It is his word. And may he bless it to our hearts. You know, even the casual, casual reader of the Bible knows and will gather the things that we have read they're really aligned to what's happening today in our world there's, there's no doubt about that there's no questioning that there's not even a doubt anymore and I think we don't need to spend much time trying to prove that because it's apparent it's visual it's literal and it's happening. The signs that Jesus talked about are happening before our very eyes. We don't need to spend too much time proving that. It's just there and we can see it every day. But what we do need to highlight, perhaps even more we need to highlight, is what we as Christians ought to be doing at the minute. Would you think about that for a minute? We know it's real. We know Jesus said in what we have read from Luke's gospel. The end is coming. This world will have an end. We know that. No question. See it taking place. Signs of the times. But what we do need to think about is what we as Christians ought to be doing, especially at the minute. See, at the end of this discourse, the Lord had an express command for his people. And sometimes it's missed among all the other things that are there. But the Lord Jesus said this in verse 28, when the things begin to happen, then look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. That's what he said. That's what he uttered. That's he used those words, look up, look up, and that ought to challenge you and I right now. That comes to us like a bolt, like an arrow from heaven itself. And if we want to please him and we want to walk with him and we want to take his word seriously, then we've got to apply this because Jesus said, look up, and it begins to happen. We say it's beginning to happen. But he said, look up and lift up your head. Because your redemption is drawing near. 
Look up. That's what Jesus said. It challenges us. Not, it doesn't say, look around. It doesn't say, look at our phones. Not look to the right or the left, whatever your preference is. It didn't say, look to this one and what rhetoric they're spewing out and propagating. And everyone's got an opinion and everything, everyone's got something to say. And we're looking to all of that so often. But the Savior comes to us tonight and he has another command and he says, look up. I remember hearing a preacher a few months ago and I thought it was so simple, it was brilliant. He says, we're, we're too busy worrying about the left and the right and the left and the right and the right and the left. Are you right or are you left? He says, we forget something. There's also an up and a down. Everyone's looking to the left and looking to the right. Are you left or how far left are you? How far right are you? But there's also an up and a down. People forget that, but the Savior said, when it begins to happen, look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. Now this reminds us, and this is what we love about the scriptures, they intertwine, they connect so well, and yet so many various different authors, and that's one of the things even the skeptic of the Bible acknowledges how the Colian, how the word of God is in sync, the, the message of it from Genesis to Revelation, that thin red line that runs throughout it even, but other connections as well. And what Paul said in Colossians 3 and 2, it's so in line with what the Savior said here, because Paul said these words, set your minds on things above. And not on the things of the earth. That was Paul's word to these believers in the ancient city of Colossae. Set your minds on things above. See, see if you analyze that and just study that a little bit, you'll note the word set. Set your mind. That, that, that denotes a conscious effort. He's telling these people to do it themselves. Set your mind. But it's denoting something. You're going to have to be deliberate. You're going to have to, it's a conscious effort. And, and I was reading it the last few days and I was thinking, that I believe we've got to train our minds to do that. I was listening to someone the other day and, and he was talking about, you know, muscle memory. And if you know anything about muscle memory, it's to do with the mind. Did you do things instinctively? It happened to me the other day, by the way, come to church on a Sunday morning. I forgot how to put on the tie. <laughs> After 40 years of doing it. I didn't want to tell Jackie because she would have been worried. And I thought, how do you put on the tie? And, and I, was, I, I, was, I was sweating. I was, I was worried for my hair being worried. And I thought, there's something going wrong here. What, what is going on? And I couldn't. I was standing in the mirror. And the more I thought about it, I couldn't do it. And then I had a, a notion, <laughs> a, a brainwave, and I thought, just don't think about it, just do it. And I just done, let my arms do the work. And I done it. Because the mind took over after 40 years of training. <laughs> but when I tried to think about it, I couldn't do it. It's called muscle memory and memory of the mind as well, connected to that. But We've got to train our mind this way, to set your mind on things above. Not on the things of the earth. And that word set denotes a conscious effort. You're going to have to work at this. We're, we're going to have to work at this because honestly, the easiest thing in the world now is to notice everything that's happening here. The easiest thing in the world now is to get sucked in. I'm putting both hands up. Because I, I, I know what's happened to me. But the scriptures has a different command to us. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. We need to be heavenly minded. Listen, we need to be heavenly minded. You know why? Because we are a heavenly people. You're a 
heavenly child of God. Your destination is heaven. We're children of the kingdom, brothers and sisters. I, I think I've been mentioned before about Paul when he writes to the Philippians in that letter. The letter of Paul to the Philippians is so personal. It's the most personal letter Paul wrote. And someone described it as chatting on paper to his friends. He loved these people. They were good to him and he was good to them. They looked after him when he was in prison. They sent things. Didn't forget about him. Sent people. And he loved them. And they loved him. But if you know anything about the history of Philippi, the ancient city of Caesarea Philippi, it was a colony of Rome. So it was colonized. But the people of Philippi loved that. They loved the fact that they were a little piece of Rome. It made them feel proud. You know, that okay, they were conquered, colonized. But what did we get out of it? Well, we're part of Rome. And that done something to them that they, they took that to themselves and they were proud of that fact. And, and I often think of it in relation to our province of Northern Ireland. A wee spot in Europe, but we're part of Britain. And many was are proud of that. And of course, so many other people see themselves as part of Ireland. And they're pr part of, are proud of that. But the interesting thing is when Paul writes to these Philippians, he talks about citizenship. And here's what he says in Philippians 3 and verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven. Can you get that message he's trying to get across here? You, you're proud, a little part of Rome. But he says ultimately, don't be proud of that. Be proud of this. Your citizenship is in heaven. Now listen to this. From which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what, brothers and sisters, do you see that verse? That's for you and I right now as well. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are the same. We are a heavenly people. And because of that, we ought to look up. Now, when the things begin to happen, the Lord Jesus said, look up. Lift up your head because your redemption draws near. He said, lift up your head. Now, now that will denote something too. I think it denotes the fact that people's heads will be down. If you read the Psalms, you'll find out where King David said, the Lord's the lifter of my head. Had anybody read that in the Psalms? You'll read it. He's the lifter of my head. But do you ever think about it? For the Lord to lift his head, his head must have been down. And the Lord says to his people here, lift up your head. The heads of many Christians are often down. Many Christians are struggling these days. And the reason for that may be, or part of the reason may be, it's because they are looking to the wrong things. Now, folks, here's the, the message. Here's the point. Here's the point for you and me. It's not going to take you very long if you look at the wrong things to feel down. Because you'll be overwhelmed. And, and you know that's the case. But when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your head, because your redemption draws near. Now let me just try and bring this home a little bit by showing you what we need to look up for. Okay? What we need to look up for. So there's, there's an instruction here, look up. But we know there's a reason for that. Because as we look up, we can receive things. And, and the exciting thing is, it's still available today. The Lord said, look up. Now, what do we need to look up for? Well, in the first place, look up for salvation. Look up for salvation. Do you remember the day when you'd done that? Just reminisce for a wee bit here. Down the corridor of your history and your testimony and, and your story. Isn't it lovely that Fanny Crosby said, this is my story. 
Well, you have a story too. You've got a story. And it means something to you in the first place. Remember the day when you'd done that? Remember the time when you cried out to God in heaven and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Remember how you were disillusioned with this world and you began to look up? Remember that time when you were disillusioned with this world? Some Christians forget that. As the years go by, never forget how disillusioned you were. It wasn't working for you. What makes you think it's going to work now? Amen. But you began to look up. I can remember what happened to me. Standing in Robinson's bar on a Friday night in the summertime. Money in the pocket. Pint the harp on the bar. My mates all around me. You're young and everything's alive, everything to live for, and I was breaking inside. It just wasn't working for me. It just wasn't cutting. And I remember walking out that night at that bar in a summer's night, walking up Royal Avenue, walking up Peter's Hill, my mum and dad's house, staying in all the next day Saturday, and went to church on Sunday night and get saved. And you know what? My mate was with me. And he phoned me last week on my birthday. And he reminded me of that night. He says, remember that night we went to the church? Remember that night? I've hardly seen you since you sin. But we were disillusioned. Look up for salvation. You see, the Lord said this in Isaiah 45 and verse 22. Look to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. If you're not saved tonight, that's your greatest need. You happen to be in the people's church tonight, but your life hasn't been transformed by the saving grace of the living God. You need that more than you need anything else in this world. And you've got to look up. But here's the good news. He's there for you. And we say it all the time. He's only a prayer away. Look to me and be saved. Don't you love this verse? Verse, all the ends of the earth. I love this bit, by the way. There's, there's power in this bit. For I am God, and there's no one else. Thank God for the day we've done that. But here's the message tonight, folks. Come on. Here's the message for us tonight. We've got to keep looking up. Okay, we looked up for salvation. It was wonderful. But you've got to keep looking up, especially now. Keep looking up. Remember when you looked away from the word because it wasn't cutting it for you? It was the road in no time. It was destroying you. You were disillusioned with it. Discontent. So was I. That's what I told you a little bit. So was I. And, and you began to look up. We've got to keep looking up. What for now? For stability and sanity. Let me say it to you again. For stability and sanity. Especially at the minute. Sometimes you feel the world can't get any crazier. And then it does. The chaos is getting worse. The mayhem is increasing. People, I wrote this down and I'm standing by it. People are literally losing their minds at the minute. And with it, the will to live. Now we need to realize that I was with someone the other day who's not a Christian and he told me, he said, you see, if they told me bad news and told me I could have treatment and it would help me, he says, I don't think I would just take the, the, the treatment. I just want to go now and fill up this place. People are literally losing the will to live. People don't see any sense, any logic, any hope. But that's why you have to look up. For stability and sanity. There's something more for the Christian. We walk to a different drumbeat. Our eyes are, are on a different goal. And listen, remind ourselves tonight, come on, we're going to a different place. Now that keeps your mind in check. That, that's what I'm bringing. This is where the sanity comes in. I'm being really respectful. People are literally, I'm, I'm the utmost respect now, but it's happening. Literally losing their minds in this world. 
But this keeps your mind in check. And it also makes you not lose heart. You see, the psalmist said in Psalm 27 and verse 13, I would have lost heart unless I believed that I was going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, a lot of us can resonate with that because we feel the same. But there's something overarching that, there's something overriding that. You know what it is? Living faith. He said these words, I believe. I was going to see the goodness of the Lord. Where? A lot of us think, well, when we all get to heaven, what a glorious day that will be. And it will be a glorious day. But this man had a different idea. He said this, I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, in this darkened world. He said, I'm going to see God doing things. I'm going to see God working. I'm going to see God coming through. I'm going to see his light. I'm going to see his power. I would have lost heart unless I believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I want to tell you tonight, hang on to that too. Hang on to that tonight. Whatever you're praying for, hang on to it and say, I would have lost heart. Oh, and the devil would have rubbed his hands. But for one thing, I believe I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord. Not just when I get to heaven. But now, in the land of the living, we say good amen, brothers and sisters. Look up for that sort of stability and sanity. Thank God we have a shepherd. Something else for strength. King David said in Psalm 121, listen to this now. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where comes my strength? My strength and my help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and earth. But look how he started. I'll lift up my eyes. See, he's doing it. He's doing it and we need to do it. If we ever need to be looking up as the Lord's people, we need to, to be for that strength. For that strength, the one we serve by the way is the one who made heaven and earth. And if he can do all that, he can look after you. And we read in Luke 21, and it talks about people's heart, hearts failing them from fear. I, I don't believe God's people should be like that. Because he made heaven and earth. And if he can do all of that, by the way, he, he, here's the real interesting thing about cosmology. It's not just it's created, it's sustained. He didn't just make it, he keeps it to me. He holds it in his hand, he sustains it. Do you know the gases in our planet, even in our atmosphere, conducive for human living, are just right to the last finest detail? If they were out of sync by one dot or one minute detail, we couldn't survive. But it's just right. No sad to say, it's just a flick. It's just a flick. We don't have enough faith to believe that. We have a creator. But he's not only that, folks. Come on. He's a father. And he made heaven and earth. And he has strength in you every day as you look to him. You gotta look to him every day for strength. Man. You, honestly, you do. Every day. You've got to be deliberate. You've got to even, honestly, even though it means writing it down at night before you go to bed, say, the first thing in the morning, before I do anything, I'm going to lift up my eyes. You've got to be that deliberate. It's so crucial. I, I love Jehoshaphat. I'm going to end here. But Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And he's just, he's a king, but he has troubles the same way you and I do. And then he got bad news one day. Someone said, they're all coming to get you. Look at a lot of people who bring you bad news, by the way. Do you know you're having a good day and you wrap your door and say, there's 400 coming. <laughs> and I just saw them over the hill. And you want to see what they have with them. And you want to see the God. You want to see the equipment and the armory they have. And this man, and there's only one agenda, Jehoshaphat. Now here's what Jehoshaphat did. Are you ready for this? 
he looked up. 2 Chronicles 20 and 12, Israel said, O our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But here's what he said, but our eyes are on you. And, and I've been on the time to read on, read on that chapter. God responded to that in an amazing way. Here's what he said to Joseph, Jehoshaphat, forget about it. The battle's over. And here's what, he, here's what God said to Jehoshaphat, you will have to fight in this battle. The battle is the Lord's. And all that man done was look up. Do you know there's a painting in Manchester Art Gallery of Daniel in the Lion's Den? It's one of hundreds, if not thousands, of poor paintings that have been portrayed over the years of Daniel in the Lion's Den. But this one's different. And everyone knows why it's different. Because in that painting in Manchester in the Art Gallery, the City Art Gallery in Manchester. Daniel in the Lion's Den. And what makes this different and significant is this. The lions are, are so ferocious around them. The, the detail is incredible. They're not caricatures. There is incredible detail. But that's not what makes the painting significant. The darkness of the den is there for everyone to see as well. But that, even that's not what makes it significant. It's Daniel. Because as, as all of that's going on around him, Daniel is portrayed as looking up and his eyes are fixed upon heaven. And that made the difference. And brothers and sisters, the message is the same for you and me tonight. But the Lord Jesus said, when it begins to happen, don't be looking around you. Don't be looking to the right. Don't be looking to the left. Don't be looking to this one who has propagated rhetoric and he said, don't. He said something different. Look up. Lift up your head for your redemption draws nigh. That's our ultimate, by the way. See, you, you read that and you say, I, when I said I was a first Christian, the first Christian, I, I read that and it says, Lift up your head because your redemption draws near. And I thought, I thought I was redeemed. But this is telling me my redemption is drawing near. But of course, what the Lord is, is indicating there is the culmination of our redemption. Yes. We're redeemed from our sins tonight, thank God. They're forgiven. But we're not redeemed from these mortal bodies that are riddled with pain sometimes. Or these minds that are overburdened with worry, no matter how hard you try sometimes. Or the assault of the evil one. Or the things of this life. But Jesus is coming. And his kingdom is with him. And the brothers and sisters tonight, the verse says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And it's true. But he's not only for us, he's coming for us. He's coming for us. And we've got to keep our eyes on that at the minute. Honestly, you know, you don't need us to tell you. You can be sucked in. It's a battle. It's a constant battle. Don't let it happen. Can we bow our heads for a second? Can we just look to the Lord for a moment? I know the band are going to come up, and we're going to do what we've been talking about. Close our eyes, lift our hands, look up. But may he come to us in these moments, at the end of our time here. And Lord, we really ask you to do that right now because we need you. And constantly we need you. And Lord, we want to take your word, your word, you said it, we want to take it and apply it and live it. And Lord, if you know our hearts, we fear, we fear. But Lord, our fear is if we get too caught up with things, there'll be no use for you. We 
not be effective the way you want us to. So Lord, we're saying, help us. Even if we've got to check it every day, even if we've got to mark it every day, Lord, the days are evil, but we're looking to you. And Lord, when you raise up your people these days, not just in the people's church, but throughout the land, throughout the nation, and Lord, may the church be strong. And more than anything, may the gospel be seen and heard and understood. May lives be changed forever. Thank you for being with us tonight. Lord, as we worship now, will you build your throne? Will you come to us and have your way in Jesus' name? Amen. Lift up your head. again to celebrate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that souls will be saved this coming weekend. 
Keep your hand upon every brother and sister. And Lord, bless the other churches in the life. We pray that you'll protect them as well and keep them safe too. Separate us with your blessing because we ask it all in the lovely name of our Savior, the coming King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Everybody say it.